So hi, everyone. Um, I'm Alan. Uh, some of you might remember me as the engineer formerly known as Alan DC. Uh, and I'm here today to talk to you about NASA CARA, uh, CARA standing for the Conjunction Analysis and Risk um, Assessment uh, Mission, uh, or uh, in the parlance of bad 1950, 1950s science fiction, air traffic control in space. Uh, but actually, before I get into that, uh, I am going to put out a quick disclaimer. Uh, this is a NASA project. I have a NASA badge. I'm not wearing that NASA badge right now. As far as this room is concerned, I'm just a dork who happens to be aware of the fact that this project exists and has a whole bunch of published material out about it. Um, two practical takeaways there. One, if I lie to you, that's my lie. It's not NASA's. Um, any errata are entirely on me. Two, uh, this is a room full of very intelligent, very insightful people. You might ask incisive questions that, in theory, I could answer. Uh, if it requires me to peer behind the curtain and give you a peek somewhere that isn't published, um, give you a peek on information that's not published, publicly available, I'm going to have to refrain from answering that. Thank you uh, for your patience. And let's get into it. So a uh, brief, brief structure of the talk. We're first going to talk about the CARA mission, what exactly it is, um, why it's not completely trivial and what happens when we get it wrong, and then we're going to roll on through into the algorithms that underpin it, um, identifying conjunctions, identifying conjunctions that are high risk, and then identifying activities uh, which work well to remediate those risks. So, Kara in theory, no better place to start than the mission statement, which I'm going to read off here just in case anybody's glasses aren't doing their job very well. Uh, to take prudent measures at reasonable cost to enhance safety of flight without placing undue burden on mission operators. And I want to I wanna just stand here for a second and appreciate this mission statement and the fact that it accounts for both the value of the mission and the cost that it imposes. It's almost like there might have been an engineer in the room at some point while it was being written. And that's just, it's a beautiful thing. It doesn't happen very often, and it makes me happy. Uh, what does this wind up looking like in practice? Uh, the inputs to the pipeline wind up being information um, about where satellites are going. And there are two places where we can get that. For cooperating missions, they can just tell you, this is where we think our satellite is. This is where we think it's going. That's the best case. Uh, there is a lot of stuff in space which would be considered uncooperative. Um, and for that information, uh, NASA CARA depends on information uh, from the space catalog uh, which is maintained by the Combined Space, uh, Space Operations Center, CSPOC. Um, and I say uncooperative. Uh, what's probably come to mind for a lot of you is images of Winnie the Pooh and Christopher Robin shooting bottle rockets off uh, in the 100 Acre Woods and then not bothering to tell anybody where they're going. That's not the primary source of uncooperative stuff. Uh, it's a major problem. Uh, coordinating across nations is challenging. But the great bulk of the uncooperative things in space are trash. Most of the stuff in space, and it's not by a small margin, is just junk that got left up, uh, left up in orbit, uh, debris from a launch or debris from a previous collision. So once we have these, uh, at the start of the pipeline, we push it through. We're going to talk about what happens while we push it through a little bit later. Um, at the end of that pipeline, we want two things. One, we want notifications to protected missions uh, about when there's a high interest event coming up, um, high interest event or HIE being the term of art for a conjunction with a significant risk of collision. And then uh, we also want advice for the missions when they have an HIE on what they can do to remediate that. The end goal being the avoidance of more incidents like the Cosmos Iridium incident, which for those of you that weren't tuned into the news, in 2009 a defunct uh, Russian military satellite and a live telecom satellite smashed into each other rather spectacularly. Um, thousands of pieces of debris generated in the process. All right, so let's get into the complexity question, um, why it's hard. Uh, this room should be particularly keen to learn about this, given that you've had to deal with perf and demonstrating complexity for a while. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, when I first heard about Kara, I was honestly a little bit confused about why this was something that was hard to do in the first place, because I, I went to middle school, I went to high school, and I learned this equation here on the screen, uh, which governs uh, the motion of celestial bodies. Gravity is a function of a gravitational constant, the mass of the body that you're orbiting, and then it drops off as 1 over r squared. And this has been known since Newton and Kepler, uh, and it's known that the solution to this is always a conic section, which for a closed orbit is an ellipse. So 
why don't I, like the physics teacher who holds up the pendulum, throws the, throws it, well, hopefully he doesn't throw it, he's gonna get a bloody nose if he throws it, lets it go, uh, why doesn't he just, you know, trust that it doesn't come back and hit him in the nose? Why don't I do the same thing with orbits and just put them up in the right place so that they're not going to collide with one another? Uh, why don't I just trust uh, that, like the stars, my, my satellites are going to hold their course and their aim, return and return, and always be the same? And I hear you, Javert, but it's not so simple because we have perturbations to deal with. And uh, since we're talking about gravity as our primary um, term in the model, let's start with gravitational perturbations. There are things, and I don't want to blow anybody's mind, but there are things with mass that are not your satellite and that are not the Earth. Um, fortunately, even when we're trying to create a high quality model, uh, we can ignore most of those things. Uh, but the sun and the moon wind up being relevant. They're gonna be yanking around our satellite in addition to the Earth. And then they're also gonna be yanking around the Earth, which is a problem for us because the Earth is what we want to measure in reference to, which means that the sun and the moon, in addition to moving our satellite around, are moving our reference around. They are shaking our camera, which means we need to smooth that out as well. So that's our first term, point mass uh, perturbations. Well, our second term. Our third term here is going to be non-sphericity. So our two-body equation used point masses. And again, not to blow anybody's mind, but the Earth is not a point. And you might be saying here, but I know about the shell theorem. And the Earth is a sphere. Spheres act like points. It's all fine. The Earth's not a sphere either. Um, there are a couple of different things uh, which distort uh, the Earth's would-be spherical shape. Um, tidal forces are one of them. Uh, the moon is several times a day sloshing the water on its surface around several meters. More importantly, the centrifugal forces around the equator uh, cause a bulge on the order of kilometers, uh, which will cause significant changes in geopotential. But I don't want to just you know, sweep that under the rug. Um, I don't know if any of you are like me, but I am so accustomed to treating masses as point. You, know, you have your physics class, you have your bar, you, just, you find the center of gravity, you draw the arrow from it, boom, we're done. It took me a minute uh, to really develop an intuitive understanding and say that, okay, it's not a sphere, but like, is it not still a point mass? I, I want it to be a point mass. I've used point masses so much that I want them to be so. So we could do the integral and uh, we, could, we could learn in that fashion. I'm going to propose that we do a thought experiment instead. So we're going to imagine here that the Earth is perfectly flat. The Earth is not flat, okay? But we're going to imagine that the Earth has been made perfectly flat. Uh, so in the process of being flattened, uh, we see a couple of things. So if we focus just on our y-axis there, uh, we're going to see that the northern hemisphere, our close mass to our object, has been pushed away. Uh, arguably, the, math, uh, the mass in the southern hemisphere has been pushed closer, but gravity goes as one over r squared. So we lose more gravity from losing that northern hemisphere than we get from, from getting the southern hemisphere closer. At the same time, we observe that the angle of pole uh, at the widest points um, and throughout has been widened, which means that we have more, more pole going in the x direction, which is wasted uh, because there's going to be a pole x and there's always going to be a pole negative x. This is a symmetrical system. So we have greater cancellation effects. Both of those tied together give us significantly decreased polar gravity. Uh, we can come at this in another direction because I see a couple of blank stairs. Um, let's start from a sphere. We're going to take the shell theorem and we're going to say, okay, well, if a sphere is a point, let's start by taking the Earth, making it supernova, and collapsing it down to a point. So the Earth is a point. We haven't changed its geopotential at all. And now we're going to start spinning it. We spin it, we spin it, we spin it. And as we spin it, we turn it into a disk. And what we observe is that all of the mass which is moving out into the disk is strictly further away from our mass at the top. So that's one deterioration. And also, as we move it further away, the angle at which, it's being, at which it's being pulled is widening and widening, and we're getting more and more cancellation. So polar gravity, once again, significantly decreased. There we go. All right, next, next perturbation, indirect oblation. So for point masses, we mentioned that the sun and the moon, they're yanking the earth around, they're shaking our camera. But that's a, that's a second order effect. Uh, Non-sphericity is a second order effect, so can we maybe just ignore the second order effect of a second order effect where the non-sphericity of the earth is causing it to be yanked around, not quite the way that our point mass equations uh, we're expecting. And for most things that's true, uh, for the earth and moon, actually we can't. So we have another smoothing, smoothing term that we need to keep our camera steady. And then, then we're done with gravity, okay? We've, we've taken care of our gravitational terms. This Diffie Q is starting to look scary, 
but at least we're done with gravity. And being done with gravity, unfortunately, brings us into forces which are still worse. Uh, so recall the drag equation is going to go as the density of atmosphere and the square velocity and then a couple of terms to account for the shape and orientation of the object moving through atmosphere. Now, we like to think of space as being completely empty. And you go far enough into space and that becomes a pretty good, pretty good model. Um, but it's not, it's not a hard breakdown, right? It's a smooth change in density as you go further and further up. There's, there's no Emir school, uh, skull right at the top where you smash through it and then now you're in outer space. Um, and what this means for us is at low altitudes in LEO, especially at the bottom of LEO, around the 500 kilometer mark, uh, you see appreciable drag, uh, appreciable rho, and then you also see a high V squared uh, because things in low Earth gravity, low Earth gravity, low Earth orbit, uh, need to move fast to keep up with the centripetal force uh, that the Earth is exerting on them. So we get, we get double slammed there, and we wind up with a significant drag effect in LEO. It doesn't really matter so much for higher altitudes, but in LEO it's quite significant. And as a bonus, uh, this effect is non-periodic, and at least on the, the satellite, it's non-conservative, uh, which will limit uh, if we were actually going to go through and try to solve this DFEQ. Fortunately, we are not going to do that here. Um, but if we were to actually try to solve this, um, that would limit the approaches that we could take. And you might say, okay, LEO sucks, but what about high Earth, alt um, high Earth orbits? Can we get away with, with um, just our gravitational perturbations there? Um, unfortunately, uh, there's kind of a dual problem uh, to drag in solar radiation pressure. So um, either a very brief refresher or a very brief introduction to special relativity. Uh, your, your classical uh, momentum is mass times velocity. Uh, but when you get moving really fast, and we're talking you know, appreciable uh, percentages of the speed of light fast, uh, you need to add in this Lorenz factor, this gamma, and m becomes gamma m, basically in every equation, but um, the one we care about here is momentum. And okay, so that's, that's a fine little piece of physics trivia. Uh, what happens with photons? Photons have zero mass, and they're moving at the speed of light, so gamma is going to be, what happens when I multiply zero and infinity? Uh, I've, I've seen enough direct deltas to know that sometimes the answer when I multiply zero and infinity is 12. And in this specific case, it winds up being h over lambda. Um, and very, very briefly, I'm sure I put up somebody's hackles there with what I just did. There's no direct delta on screen. That's not even really what a direct delta is. You're right. I don't really care. Uh, and the reason I don't care is that I'm not concerned about my rigor because this is confirmed by experiment. Or to put it in terms that Einstein might have appreciated, uh, I don't have to worry so much about my math. I'm cribbing off of God. Anyways, so we have solar radiation pressure. Um, sorry, we're not actually there yet. So photons have finite non-zero momentum, which means that as a satellite, uh, which is absorbing or reflecting light, I am experiencing a dp dt in order to sustain conservation of momentum. Does anybody remember what dp dt is? No, it's force. That's, that's, your, that's your physics, uh, that's, that's force. <laughs> So anyways, uh, we're experiencing force, which means we're experiencing an acceleration, and um, the sun doesn't stop shining. So if you're in a high Earth orbit, you're going to be experiencing significant solar radiation pressure, which, like drag, is non-periodic and non-conservative, at least within the, the boundaries of the system that we care about. All right, last one. Thrust, and this is at once our worst and our best perturbation. Um, the good news is the fact that most satellites have a thrusting capacity, have the ability to maneuver, means that when we detect an incoming collision, we can do something about it. On the other hand, uh, like, like drag, like solar radiation pressure, this is not periodic, this is not conservative, and worse, it's not even really physical. Um, and when I say that, what I mean is not that we're using hell energy to move these satellites around, that Doom Guy's not getting involved at any point. What I mean is that they are uh, highly informed by control systems, right? Whether I'm experiencing thrust determines whether I've turned, or is determined by whether or not I've turned on my thruster. Um, so that's, I don't know whether this is in good news or bad news on that, but it's, it's there and we need to account for it. And what does is, what is all of this taken together mean? Well, I'm actually going to go back here and, if I can go back, there we go. Uh, just take a moment here and look at that differential equation. I, how many people in this room have taken a Diffie-Q's class? All right, and you're all frightened now, right? Like, this is scary. You should be scared. Just a bunch of R's doesn't look too bad. Yeah, but those R's expand to something. 
So um, it turns out uh, that people have attempted uh, to solve simplified versions of these differential equations, and they've gotten surprisingly, surprisingly far. But if you really want a high fidelity model, um, generally speaking, people have fallen back to uh, numerical integration, so things like Runge Kata um, uh, solvers to capture all of the terms and just step forward slowly through time, evolving the system as it goes. The second thing uh, that I want to note here is that this is not a completely idle notion. Sure, all models are wrong, but maybe, maybe Kepler's still useful. It's kind of not. Um, a a low-fidelity model, so like Kepler, diverges from reality surprisingly quickly. So for an example, in a low-Earth orbit, you can see in just a couple of orbital periods, that is a couple of hours, uh, differences between your projection and reality on the order of kilometers. Which if you're trying to figure out if two objects, which are several meters wide, are going to collide is maybe too much error to include. And then finally, the last thing which really, really uh, brings us home here is the reason we went down this road is because we were thinking about, well, if it's all just ellipses, why don't you just put your ellipses in the right spot and be done with it? Once you account for perturbations, you no longer have beautiful eternal shapes circling around the Earth. Everything's squiggly and wobbly and low Earth orbit decays and eventually falls into the Earth. Uh, it's messy. And uh, it's, not, it's not straightforward to just pick the right solution and be done with it. And by not straightforward, I mean you're never going to get it done. OK, any questions about complexity? All righty. So let's talk about impact, the other side of perf. Uh, <laughs> the, the obvious way to look at the impact here of what happens when we get it wrong is to look at an individual mission and, OK, how much does it cost us when we screw up? Uh, so it turns out that satellites are kind of expensive. Uh, plausible cost for a satellite is 100 million US dollars. Some are cheaper, some are more expensive, but uh, certainly you have some up there with, with price tags in that area. And a, probable, um, a plausible probability of collision, uh, we can see 2e minus 4. Uh, that number is chosen um, with intent. Uh, 1e minus 4 is the boundary uh, that Kara recommends for taking remedial action. Uh, so uh, this is a little bit above that, but not so far above that is, as to allow me to create um, an exorbitant expected cost. So we finish our back of the envelope calculation, and it's 20,000 US dollars. Uh, this might be worth putting a little bit of work into remediating, although this is not actually going to be very good in my perf packet, uh, because it turns out that um, by, by NASA Kara's own admission, something like 85% of likely lethal conjunctors aren't even tracked. They're not going through the pipeline, which means, okay, sure, we have a bunch of these $20,000 events that we can, we can uh, mitigate, but there's a whole bunch that are flying under the radar and we're apparently just okay with. So how are we going to get our promotion? We're not going to focus on mission safety. We're going to focus on domain safety. Um, and all facetiousness aside, this is genuinely, in my, genuinely, in my opinion, the more important side of it. Uh, it's worth noting that any collision increases the hazard to the ecosystem. I mentioned earlier in the Cosmos Iridium incident, uh, we had thousands of new pieces of debris created. More debris means more conjunctions, more conjunctions, more opportunity for collisions, more opportunities for collisions. If you're not properly remediating them, more collisions. Uh, so we don't want more trash in orbit. Um, and it's, it's worth noting that if our goal is to reduce the amount of trash in orbit, that not all collisions are created equal. Uh, the amount of debris created from a collision is strongly influenced by the mass of the two objects colliding. So if I have a small object, you know, one, two centimeters long, and it shoots through my satellite, it's probably going to shoot through my satellite. There will be a few new pieces of trash created, but it's going to kill my satellite and not create you know, a minefield. If I have two satellites that collide with each other, then, then we get the minefield. Things splash when they, when they um, come into contact. So the good news is the objects that aren't going through the pipeline are the small ones. So the reason we get to that 85% number is that we have all this really small stuff that, OK, it might kill a satellite, but it's at least not going to massively degrade the overall safety of the domain. And so long as I'm talking about domain safety, some of you probably already know where I'm going with this. But it should be noted that orbit contention is a self-reinforcing phenomenon. There is a positive feedback loop here. More objects, more conjunctions, more conjunctions, more collisions, more collisions, more objects. Uh, systems with positive feedback loops have criticality points. Um, and uh, in, in the case of objects in orbit, that criticality point gives way to something called uh, Kessler syndrome, after the NASA engineer who uh, first, pioneered, <laughs> first pioneered it. You saw it coming? Well done, sir. 
so what happens in Kessler syndrome is uh, we have a critical density of stuff in orbit. Then you have a collision. It creates a whole bunch more stuff, which creates a whole bunch more collisions, uh, which creates a whole bunch more. You see how it goes. Um, and at the end of that, uh, Saturn gets to be all jealous and pouty because while he has these big old fancy rings, Earth now has around herself a cloud of space junk. So suck on that, Saturn. Uh, and I should be very clear here. That's a no good, very bad day. Leo is now dead to us, um, which puts a whole lot of practical applications uh, in the ground. All right. Any questions there before we get into the, the maths, or sorry, computer science of it all? Let's not scare you all off. All right, how do we find conjunctions? Well, first of all, what are we doing when we try to find a conjunction? Um, we are looking for two things. Um, first of all, we want to know the time of closest approach. Uh, that's hopefully fairly self-explanatory. And we want to know the state of the two conjunctors at TCA. So state uh, of an orbital element uh, is generally going to be a six vector. Um, I'm going to use Cartesian coordinates, so it's x, y, z. And then does anybody want to take a guess at what else I need to know? Yeah, that's all right. X dot, Y dot, Z dot. I need to know where it is, and I need to know where it's going. And that will determine uh, the shape of the orbit. Um, and I'm also, I don't think I have it on the slide here, but it's going to become useful later. Uh, I'm also usually going to want to know uncertainty on those, um, those state vectors. Uh, quick organizational note, this is technically not a CARA responsibility. This is a CSPOC thing that is done on behalf of CARA, but it's, it's very important to CARA. Um, and CARA documents how it's done. So. We're going to do it here uh, because it's important. And the, the general model is a kind of flying ellipsoid deal, which intuitively is very obvious. Uh, yeah, I think it's just barely big enough there. Um, we have here pictured a primary object and a secondary object. The primary object is our mission payload. The secondary object is whatever is coming near to it, um, potentially. Uh, probably, again, debris. And our algorithm is going to look at each pair of primary and secondaries, and we're going to watch as it moves through time. And oh, look, uh, the secondary has gotten close to the primary. It's inside what we call a safety volume. I'm going to register a conjunction. That's 90% that's of it. It's, it's really, really simple. Uh, there are more, more clever algorithms, but this is the one that's documented as being used, so this is the one I'm telling you about. Uh, in, in pseudocode here, and this is where I'm going to actually need, need the pointer. Uh, so this up here, uh, for PST, this is just our loop over primaries and secondaries. And of course, we need to look at different, different chunks of time. We're drawing our ellipsoid. We're checking if the secondary is inside the ellipsoid. And OK, that's, that's what we've discussed so far. Next step is a little bit of a dedupe step. So if we go backwards, and if you squint, because this is not quite as bright of a projector as I would have liked, you'll notice that the secondary is is inside, it's overlapping that safety volume in two different frames, right? And in principle, it could overlap in any number of, of frames. And I really only want to emit one conjunction. I want to know just the time of closest approach, not just it's been close and getting closer to the closest approach. So we're going to go through a dedupe step, and we're going to apply some high school calculus uh, to it. We're going to define a distance function. This is your standard Euclidean distance. And we're going to look for a local optimum. Does anybody remember what the? Uh, Derivative does at a local optimum of a smooth function. Zero. Yes, thank you. Finally, some, uh, some participation. <laughs> at, at local optimum, uh, which because we're, we're nearing a closest approach, we'll assume is a local minimum, uh, we will have a derivative of zero. So if I have a smooth function and it goes from negative to positive, then there's a zero in there. So I do a sign check. And if there's no sign change, we just carry on. And we assume that we haven't set our time slices so wide that we've got an even number of, of local minima in that area. Um, I've made a leap here. I'm going to pause for a moment. Anyone want to call me on it? Why do you have a line with tiles and everything else is feet? Uh, yes. Uh, why do I have a line with tiles? Uh, because that is uh, closure, right? So we're defining a function which can be um, evaluated here at t and also t plus delta t. All right. No other takers? That's all right. Nobody else uh, in any previous iterations has gotten it yet. Uh, D prime. I've defined D. I haven't defined D prime. Anybody have any ideas on how I'm going to compute D prime? I'll give you a hint. X, Y, Z, X dot, Y dot, Z dot. All right, Alex Perry, you're, you're nodding your head. Sorry, I, I was assuming that's what you did, but yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. Okay, uh, so I'm going to stop being. Um, I'm just going to stop being coy, and I'm just going to tell you. Uh, the trick to calculating d prime here is that we have inside of. Oop, that's not what I wanted. We have inside of our p, we have a position and we have a velocity. So if I take this function here and I put it through a chain rule, I'm going to get terms involving position. I'm going to get terms involving the derivative of position. That's velocity. I have easy access to those, so bingo, bango, we have easy computation of d prime. All right, so that's our check, and then we've made it through, we've deduped, we've decided that yes, t star is somewhere in this interval, but we don't want to just say it's somewhere between t and t plus delta t. One minute's good enough, right? Just go from there. Um, we're going to want to get it down to a specific time point, and this argument maybe looks scary. It looks like I'm sweeping a whole bunch of stuff under the rug. Uh, we have d, we have d prime. This is really easy. This is just a standard root finding technique. Uh, a lot of very, very well-known numerical methods, uh, Newton's method, secant method, bisection method, all of those can be applied here, uh, and you will get to your answer uh, within a reasonable number of iterations. And then you go ahead and emit the result, and you finish your conjunction screening. Any questions? All righty. Let's talk about what we do with our conjunctions. So uh, our goal here, remember, is to provide safety to assets in space. So uh, one of the most Yeah, yeah, that's better. Um, on, the, on the other one, you're saying you have to do an argument um, o over d, but uh, d has got, got a quadratic curve to it, right? So how non-straight is uh, d prime? How non-straight is d prime? I actually don't remember off the top of my head. Okay, that's fine. Just thought it us. Thank you. We have another question in the back there. <coughs> Uh, is it, like, are there few enough objects that it's feasible to just do this for every pair, or do you have to, like, filter them down somehow to, before pairing oh, them up? Oh, we're being up? clever. Um, so there are things called time-independent filters, uh, which you can apply in front of this. Um, so things like apogee-perigee filters are sometimes uh, put in front. Um, an apogee-perigee filter being basically somebody taking a look at that initial idea of how just, like, well, if the ellipses are nowhere near one another, they're not going, so yeah. if the highest point that I get to is considerably lower than the lowest point that you get to, no possible overlaps. So you can, you can do some pruning there. Uh, it's important to be careful uh, with your time independent filters. If you screw them up, you will screw up your final results. Um, and there are other algorithms uh, which are um, more clever than this and don't absorb, um, don't demonstrate this sort of n squared um, behavior. Uh, if you're really interested, I would direct you towards something called C-Civ, um, Conjunction Civ, published by Eric George. Um, you can find it on scholar.google.com, real easy. Um, and it will, it will take you through a, a more sophisticated approach uh, to doing this. Cool. Another question. I love it. Uh, exactly. A question, but I think an observation, I think multidimensional scaling does the same thing, but over a bigger number of objects. Define multidimensional scaling. So you, you don't have the pair, but you have like a larger number of objects, and then you could sort of like minimize, like it's like just some weird thing that I know from back in the day. I'm going to ask that we talk about that out of band because yeah. I'm not entirely sure what you're referring to. Okay, cool. Yeah, I don't want to don't want to derail us too hard. All right, so what do we do with these HIEs, um, or rather, how do we identify HIEs? once we have our conjunctions. Our goal here is safety for the missions. And the most intuitive way uh, to define that is standoff distance. Um, it is implicitly uh, a part of our procedure for volumetric screening, the idea that if I'm far away from you, I'm definitely not touching you. Um, but this, it's good, but it's also kind of bad. Um, it's, it's nice in the sense that it has this, this intuitive meaning. It's troublesome because how far apart is far apart? Um, if you have 
uh, two children in the back seat of a Winnebago on their way to Disney World, and one of them's you know, holding their finger out in front of the other. One centimeter is, is plenty fine to assert with confidence that I'm not touching you. Um, in the context of satellites in orbit, that's obviously not far enough. But do we, do we need meters? Do we need kilometers? How many kilometers? Um, if we use uh, this sort of measure, we find ourselves drifting toward conservatism um, in, in our mode of operation, which is not quantified. Now, as SREs, um, you probably know what you want to do. You want to quantify your uncertainty. So let's quantify our uncertainty. Let's use instead of standoff distance, which, by the way, sorry, I leapt ahead too early there. Uh, that conservatism is useful um, for human uh, spaceflight assets because um, even though the satellite uh, that I mentioned earlier is, according to the Department of Transportation, worth more than a human life, um, that's, not the <laughs> that's not the policy that NASA follows. So we try very hard to keep things like the ISS uh, from, from going up um, in flame. Uh, but for, for attributable assets, we want to be uh, more more measured in our response. Uh, so what we, what we do to track uncertainty is we, we use the standard quantification of uncertainty probability. Um, this is the industry standard. It solves most of the problems that we have with standoff distance. Uh, it does have one significant problem. And that problem is that space is big. Space is really, 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 really big. So if I have just rubbish measurements, uh, and by that I mean they're imprecise, and I know that they're imprecise, so my uh, uncertainty is very high, then my probability of collision is going to go to zero, regardless of the path of my two objects, just because there's so much space that their positions have been diluted across. Uh, this does not mean, uh, even though the road is mostly empty, that it's a good idea to close your eyes and slam on the gas. Um, so we have to be careful uh, when we are looking at these probabilities of collision and when we're designing these systems uh, to take this, this feature of space and of the problem into account. But we are going to focus on PC. So how do we calculate PC? First principles approach uh, is I'm just going to go ahead and integrate across the state space. And then I'm going to have an indicator function that says whether there's a collision. Um, this is real tough. Uh, first of all, uh, our state vectors we previously discussed are six-dimensional. Uh, so that's 12 dimensions of integral that I've got to work through. Uh, and then that indicator function is, is an absolute nightmare. I have no clue what sort of boundaries it's going to impose on that 12 dimensional space. Because if I'm doing this really rigorously, uh, I'm going to include all of those perturbations we were talking about before. Uh, and I couldn't even solve that uh, differential equation to begin with, much less figure out how it injects into this, this integral. So you know, when the, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Um, I, meanwhile, I like to look at the licking flames all around me and say that this is fine. So let's make some simplifying assumptions. And we're going to make a lot of them uh, to get to, to 2D PC. Um, this is, this is um, sort of the first operational uh, PC calculation algorithm that was, was discovered. And we're going to have state position vectors, um, R1 and R2. Uh, we're going to say they're Gaussian. Uh, we're going to say that those position vectors are independent. We're going to pretend that we know exactly where they're going. Um, we're going to pretend that position uncertainty doesn't change at any point in time. Um, and we're actually not even going to pretend that this is a two-body equation of motion. We're going to pretend that these are moving in a straight line forever. Um, and, and they're spheres, because that's going to make life easier. Uh, this, <laughs> this is not reality. But boy, does it make the calculations easier. Um, so the core idea here. Uh, because it's not completely trivial even with all those assumptions, is we're not going to think about either of the two um, position vectors independently. We're going to look at the miss vector, the difference between them. And then we're going to integrate the probability distribution of that new random variable um, against an indicator function, much as we were in our original naive conception. Uh, already, we're down to three dimensions. So this is, this is looking positive. And uh, let's start uh, with our probability distribution. Um, and we'll recall that we said that R1 and R2 are independent and Gaussian, and R miss is a linear combination of the two, so it's also Gaussian. Gaussians are awesome. We love Gaussians because they do things like this, uh, which means that I now know uh, the shape of rho miss. It's just Gaussian PDF. Excellent. What about the indicator? Um, so 
we have the, the answer there spoiled for you on screen. I want you to not pay too much attention to that just yet. And I want you to think about how close you can get sphere A, sphere B, sorry, sphere one, sphere two. How close can you get these to each other um, before they start touching? It's going to be the sum of the two radii, yeah? So how large can our miss vector be? Uh, or how large does our miss vector need to be for us not to be in collision? It needs to be greater than the sum of those two radii. Um, alternately, we can say that if you're in a ball, if you're in a neighborhood around our miss vector of um, size HBr1 plus HBr2, our two hard body radii, then we are in collision. That's at time t equals zero. Now, uh, we have the collision uh, can occur theoretically at any time from minus infinity to plus infinity because we've said linear motion. So uh, what happens as we translate forward in time? Well, now we're going to need to translate our miss vector by a miss velocity, which is, once again, just the difference of our two velocities. We had no uncertainty on those, so that's not complicated. We multiply t into that, and we're going to have our miss, uh, sorry, our collision ball. It's going to sweep forward and give us half a cylinder. And then it can occur before time of uh, closest approach. It's going to sweep backward and give us the other half of the cylinder. So we have this infinite cylinder uh, of area over which we need to integrate our probability distribution function. And it actually gets even better. That's actually a manageable uh, shape on its own. But because it's an infinite cylinder, well, we can rotate it, put the z-axis facing us, and then it's going to marginalize to zero. Sorry, to one. And uh, for anybody that, you know, your, your probability theory is a little bit rusty, this is the continuous space uh, equivalent of saying the probability of A is the probability of A and B plus the probability of A and not B. Right? All of the possible values of z are accounted for, so we can kind of sweep it away um, trivially. And that, that's pretty much where we stop. Uh, we do a little bit of massaging, uh, which I'm not going to show on screen here. And the final shape of the integral is going to look like this, which is not fully analytic. Um, but it's a two-dimensional integral over a well-described area. Um, the function inside is pretty simple. Standard numerical quadrature techniques will take us home, no problem. But I, I mentioned this earlier. That was a whole lot of assumptions that we made. Uh, so we just treated our two conjunctures like a pair of bullets, and this is pretty good sometimes. Things in space are going fast, which means, because they have high absolute velocities, that they will frequently have high relative velocities. And then our, our hyperkinetic assumptions more or less hold. But they don't always occur like that. So can we do better? And uh, hint, hint, yes. Um, although it gets a lot more complicated, and we're not going to go all the way through it. Um, so the, the core idea uh, of the approach that finally did better, the original technique uh, published in 1992, this technique, 2021. Um, the core idea here is that we're actually going to throw away PC, and we're going to look at the expected number of collisions. And to do that, we're going to take finite time bounds. We're not going to do plus infinity to minus infinity anymore. That's not helping us here. Uh, and we're going to integrate the expected rate of collision over that time box. Um, this is, again, technically not PC. This is number of collisions. But if you are looking at a single encounter conjunction, the distinction is academic. All right. So let's, let's look inside. What's that expectation look like? And boy, that looks familiar. That's our, that's our 12D integral. Um, ignore that for now. Let's just look at n, uh, n dot c. And to calculate that, we're actually going to start with n overlap, which is a step function around our collision ball. Uh, Yes, it's, it's in fact exactly our collision ball. Um, that should be familiar. And we can go ahead and we can rewrite that as a uh, heavy side step function of r squared minus r transpose r. It's just a little bit of algebra. Um, and now, now we want to take the derivative of a non-continuous function, uh, which I'm telling you is that thing at the bottom there. It's that weird delta multiplied by minus 2r transpose r dot. Um, and this is, this is kind of me cheating. I mentioned Dirac deltas earlier. Who in the room remembers what a Dirac delta is? Just real quick. All right, we got one, one person. OK, um, so step function does not have a derivative. But it sort of has a function um, that it is the antiderivative of. Uh, and what we're going to do, and I will explain this in more detail after the talk for anybody that's interested uh, when I have a whiteboard and I'm not already running over on time, um, what we're going to do is we're going to define a magic function delta, which is zero everywhere except at origin. And at origin, it's infinity. 
And it's a very special infinity such that if I integrate over it, it's 1. I'm going to say that again. Magic function, 0 everywhere except at the origin. And there, there it's infinity. And if I integrate over that area, I get 1 back. And it should be pretty straightforward. Uh, you can do this um, you know, as an exercise for the reader to see that if you integrate over that function, you get a step function back out the other end. Uh, so trusting that this magic function exists, uh, that this magical Dirac delta exists, we can get a function, uh, n dot overlap, which looks like that, uh, and which is, is um, something we can slam into our integral, except we need n dot c, uh, not n dot overlap. And n dot overlap, while close, is going to do something for us that we don't want. It's going to subtract egress from our collision ball in addition to adding ingress. But that's actually a really easy fix. We just throw a threshold uh, onto n dot overlap, and we get that function there, Dirac delta r squared minus r transpose r, uh, minus 2 r transpose uh, r dot, and thresholded at 0. Bang, we have our interior. And now we can go back to the part that I'm not going not gonna to wait all the way through with you. <laughs> this, this is really a, a fairly heroic effort uh, to massage this all the way down uh, to its final form. And I encourage anybody who's interested to go through and find the pub. Uh, it's in the references section. Uh, of, of this deck. Um, if, you, if you want to read through and, and fully understand the, the algebra involved, please do. Um, again, please take my word for it. Uh, if, you, if you do the work, uh, you can eventually get it down to a two-dimensional surface integral over our, over our collision ball, which then traces uh, through time uh, because we had that initial outer time integral. And if we pump a lot of hand wavium into the room, so like just a whole bunch of it, we can intuitively understand this as watching this surface of our collision um, ball and moving it through time. And any time that uh, the two satellites come into contact with one another, they must be on that surface of the ball. So we're, we're integrating the probability mass over that over time. Again, a lot of hand wavium in the room to make that work. Uh, we, had, we had previously here, right, delta. That delta is what you would intuitively expect to exist for that, that operation there where we're tracking the collision. But then there's this minus 2 r transpose r dot thing happening. Calculus requires that you actually do the work. Otherwise, you will get wrong answers. Uh, so just uh, bear in mind that was very unrigorous. Um, but the important thing to note here uh, from an operational perspective is that three dimensions of integration Okay, it's starting to get a little bit expensive. Uh, the cursive dimensionality is starting to become real. But it's not so bad uh, that we can't handle this uh, reasonably quickly. So we have a computationally effective method, which is only assuming elliptical motion. Um, it's not going to have the full uh, perturbed equation of motion. But elliptical motion, it turns out, over short time periods is pretty good. Any questions? <laughs> Yeah, OK. Uh, I, didn't get into, I didn't get into computer science to do integrals. That's what the maths degree is for. Uh, so let's, let's leave all this integration behind and note that this fancy 3D PC thing, which we didn't even have time to get all the way through, um, and I'm sure I would have lost all of you if I tried, um, that still had to make simplifying assumptions. So we still assumed um, elliptical motion in our two bodies. Um, and that doesn't feel good. So this is a stochastic process. Can we, can we model it stochastically? Can we throw a Monte Carlo at it? And well, yes, yes, you can. So this is this is pseudocode for a from epoch Monte Carlo. I'm going to take probability distributions for my primaries at orbit determination. That is to say, the last time that I had a measurement for it. Uh, I'm going to take probability distributions for my primary and secondary objects. I'm going to sample them at epoch, and then I'm going to propagate their states forward up past the time where I expect there to be a TCA, and if they collide. Boom, I register a hit. If they don't, I carry on to the next iteration. And not having to do any fancy Monte Carlo Markov chain stuff, uh, trying to make sure that I'm sampling from the posterior. This is just plain frequentist observation that long-term rate of an event is its probability. Return hits over trials, bang, we have a result. And we've made no simplifying assumptions as long as our orbit propagation is um, done with a high fidelity solver and we run enough trials to give ourselves confidence, we have, we have a perfect solution. Um, unfortunately, if you run a, a high fidelity solver uh, millions and millions of times, 
um, especially over a long time period, it's, it's really easy uh, to set up runs where you'll get your answer back in six to nine months, uh, at which point I'm gonna know whether I had a collision. So uh, is there some way that we can maybe speed this up? Um, and the answer is again, yes, uh, which is where a from Monte, uh, sorry, from a TCA, yeah, from TCA Monte Carlo comes in. And we're gonna do basically the same thing, but we're going to start not at the last time that we saw the satellites, we're going to take this propagated uncertainty that we were using in our PC algorithms, and we're gonna draw from that. And then we're gonna propagate forward because sometimes the collision per occurs before TCA, and we're gonna propagate backwards because sometimes it occurs, um, sorry, I had this flipped. Uh, propagate forwards because sometimes it occurs after, propagate backwards because sometimes it occurs before. Um, and otherwise it's the same algorithm. We just return hits over trials, and if we wanna be you know, actually robust, uh, we do a little bit of statistics to get a, a bound on our, our certainty, but yeah. Details. Downside to this, uh, sorry, we're starting with upsides. Upside to this, this is a lot faster. Um, you only need to propagate motion locally uh, around the encounter, so you're not evolving your ODE over as long of a time period. And actually, because it is a shorter, um, shorter window of propagation, you can get away with a, a simpler scheme. Uh, in much the same way that 3D PC got away with a, an elliptical assumption of motion, we can use something like SGP4. Um, here and maybe not have quite such bad results as we would if we tried to do that with a from epoch. Um, unfortunately, this is not quite as theoretically robust as a from epoch uh, because we have, it looks like we haven't made any assumptions, but there's a hidden assumption in the way that our, prop, uh, our uncertainties have been propagated, um, which if you dive into the way that uh, uncertainty gets propagated through these, um, ODE solvers, it winds up implicitly uh, linearizing the dynamics as they evolve over time, which looks an awful lot like assuming Gaussian um, distributions, not just at the start, but at the end. Um, in practice, it turns out this doesn't matter as long as we sample in what are called curvilinear coordinates. So as long as we bend our, our Gaussian distribution uh, to align with the path of our orbit, not really a practical problem but we don't have the sort of theoretical purity that we, we had with, uh, from Epoch. And um, in practice, uh, this winds up still being a lot slower than our analytic methods and uh, performs pretty similarly to something like 3D PC. So it doesn't get used a whole lot um, in practice, but um, it's a dream worth having. Okay, any questions there about PC methods? We're almost done, I promise. All right. We have identified our conjunctions. We've identified the conjunctions that are scary. And now, now we're gonna do something about them. Uh, and uh, upon receiving a notification that we have a high interest event, as an owner operator of a satellite, I have two options. I can do something or I can do nothing. Um, and there are actually real reasons for, for doing both. Uh, the, the do something column obviously mitigates uh, the, the potential risk to the satellite, but it does burn um, fuel and or reaction mass. Um, and, uh, but it is cheaper to do, generally, the earlier that you fire off that decision. On the other hand, we observe that most of our HIEs come to nothing. Um, even if, even if we um, assumed that we never did anything, right? We're, our, our margin for saying this is a high interest event is one in 10,000. The vast majority of our HIEs, we can resolve technically by just letting them come and go and look, it didn't explode this time, except for that one in 10,000 when it does. Um, so uh, it's also worth noting though that our certainty improves as we get closer. There's less uncertainty due to propagation um, through, through time. So a lot of HIEs come to nothing and we know that they're going to come to nothing uh, before your maneuver point, which leads to the following common strategy. Make your plan, sit on your hands for a little bit. If it comes to nothing, great, we don't do anything. If we get to the point where it starts to get expensive to maneuver afterwards and it still hasn't come back clean, then okay, do something. But what's the something that we do? Uh, we have actually a lot of options uh, for exploring maneuver trade space. Uh, we have the intensity of our burn, we have the timing of that burn, um, some, some missions get really slick uh, and uh, reorient themselves in space, uh, which is doing something called um, differential drag, where they will, by reorienting themselves in space, 
change the amount of surface area that they are presenting to the atmosphere as they're moving through it, and change their drag coefficient, um, which changes their, their trajectory. This is a pretty uncommon technique, but it's just like really cool, so I have to mention it here. Um, anyways, uh, Kara has, has uh, analysis tools uh, that it maintains for, for mapping possible maneuvers um, to the expected effects on probability of collision. They are unfortunately not very well documented in the public domain, so I'm not going to go into their internals, but let's assume that they exist for a moment and accept that we have determined a, a mechanism for mitigating the risk to our primary object from a particular secondary. Um, that's great, but there's still a whole bunch of other stuff in space. So after I've, after I've maneuvered, what about all that stuff? And our, our algorithm for dealing with all that stuff is going to lean really hard, once again, into the observation that space is big. Uh, and as a consequence, if I veer uh, out of my lane uh, to dodge a pothole, whatever lane I veer into, it's probably open. Um, it's not so probably open that I'm just gonna do it. Um, but it does suggest the following iterative approach uh, to finding an acceptable remediation. Plan locally uh, for your primary and secondary. Get the probability of collision between those two objects low enough. And then pump your projected uh, flight path back into the top of the pipeline and see if any new HIEs crop up. And if nothing does, great, we're done. Um, if, on the other hand, something does, uh, then you go back and find a new maneuver and, and do it all again. And because space is big, uh, your number of expected passes through this iterative, iterative algorithm is um, it's one. Uh, you expect to try one, and most of the time, that's it. Um, very occasionally, you'll have to do uh, maybe a second, but almost never more than that. And that's it, we're done. We have gone from finding our conjunctions identifying the dangerous conjunctions, and now we have a plan in place for dealing with that conjunction. So, if you are curious uh, to read more about some of the things that I glossed over, uh, this first one, uh, this first resource, 1976, uh, not state of the art, but a really good introductory resource for uh, learning about the equations of motion uh, that we covered in the first section. Uh, the second two are uh, resources for Monte Carlo approaches and 3DPC. And then um, the NASA CARE handbook is number four. This is really, really good. It's like 200 pages of technical stuff, but like anything you wanna know about the service is in there. And then last of all, we have uh, the Space Flight Safety Handbook for Satellite Operators. Um, that is the best resource that I can find uh, for people that wanna know more about uh, the conjunction screening that we talked about uh, that CSPOC is doing. And that is me done inside the hour, hot damn. Questions? So not, not even addressing like objects, other secondary objects hitting each other, is the probability of two objects, uh, two objects being close at the same time low enough that it's not worth reasoning about? Repeat the question, I'm not sure I followed. Um, the original question was going to be, you know, object, object A is coming at you and then object B hits object A, and I'm not even gonna touch that anymore. Uh, now I'm just talking about object A and B both coming at you at the same time from different directions. Uh, it's, it's technically possible. I would be surprised to see it happen. Uh, the algorithms that we've talked about would detect it, right? You would have two separate conjunctions uh, that would both register as being of interest, and both of them would independently have high probabilities, high probabilities of collision, and then you would go and, and plan a remedial burn, which attempts to account for both of them. But again, that's a, that's a really out there scenario. Um, don't get that many conjunctions. Yeah, that, that's, that's the answer I was looking for. You were mentioning the the drag and solar um, lossy uh, part on the orbits. So an awful lot of stuff has to expend fuel just to maintain orbit. To what extent can they uh, do all of their dodging sort of for free because they're going to have to burn fuel just to speed up again? Uh, how often can you just, you know, dodge by doing the burn? You're going to have to do it sometime in the next few days anyway. I don't know. Uh, that is very much in line with the thinking of like the differential drag trick, um, but I don't have numbers on how frequently that winds up being employed. It's a good question, though. Well, this isn't necessarily a technical question, but we're talking about since you have these two, um, well, presumably maybe, well, I guess it depends on whether they're both maneuverable objects, uh, but if you had 
too. Is there like um, this other issue of well, maybe one of them is more willing to play chicken than the other, <laughs> and you know when they're trying to decide who has to move. So games of chicken. Uh, well, the good news is most of the time it's me and you know a piece of tumbleweed blowing across the road at you know a million miles an hour, so I still have to dodge it because uh, even a piece of tumbleweed uh, at orbital speeds is dangerous. Um, so. Usually, that's just not even part of the calculus. Um, in principle, you can get uh, two different payload objects uh, in conjunction with one another, and uh, this does this becomes a political challenge. Which, man, I don't know. I'm not a politician. Uh, I did wave at it very briefly at the start um, as as being something that needs to be dealt with, but that's sorry, too far outside my wheelhouse for me to speak intelligently to. Other than to say that it's hard. We have more hands up behind you. Uh, you mentioned that the the uh, probability becomes more certain as the collision becomes more and more imminent. I'm just curious, what are the sources that we're using to, because we're obviously we're not projecting for that, but we're using observational data to, what what are the ways that we can narrow that error bar? Is it? Right. So uh, what you what you tend to observe in a lot of systems is that if you have an initial uncertain state, and then you propagate that state forward in time. Now there are states that will, there are systems that will tend to narrow themselves down into like a sink and they'll. No matter where you start, they're going to circle down into the bottom of that gravity well. Um, that is not really the case uh, with orbits. So if we have uncertainty at the start, and then we start pushing them out, um, that uncertainty is going to tend to grow uh, with time, as it can now occupy even more states because it's been moving around. Uh, so that's, um, that's my understanding, at least, of how the uncertainty tends to drop off uh, as you get closer to uh, time of potential collision. And just kind of a really related question of how far into the future can you act to, like, accurately project with these models? Uh, so it depends a lot on the model that you use. Um, and it depends exactly on how, how accurate is accurate enough. Uh, whatever model you're using, uh, all models are wrong. Some are useful. So the further out in time you go, uh, the more wrong you're going to expect to be. Uh, these, these algorithms tend to run days in advance. Um, so you will have. A significant warning, and because you're running days in advance, you have to have at least that that kind of window. So, I guess practically speaking, I'll give you that kind of rough rule of thumb, um, and hopefully that's good enough. Uh, does Kara? I forget if you said this, but does Kara do the tracking as well, or just do you assume you get that from somewhere else? Uh, yes. Uh, so the the ephemerides, uh, ephemerides, whatever. Um, those, those are sourced externally. So for cooperating missions, uh, those will be delivered to Kara, and Kara can wa um, work off of those. Uh, that's particularly important for missions that are going to maneuver. Uh, for uncooperative assets, uh, that is, entities that are refusing to speak to you for one reason or another, or just have no mouths to speak, um, that is coming in from a sensor network. Um, and it's not run by Kara, but it's, it's delivered uh, to Kara um, by other entities. Cool. Yeah, I guess my question's related to his question. Like, I was wondering about the time latency of those collections, because you, and, and I guess because of a secondary question, which is how often are these foreign objects like meteorites or, or space debris that isn't from a uh, uncooperative or cooperative entity? Uh, yeah, so there are technically things that are not you know, in orbit that move into, into orbit. Uh, the vast majority uh, of, of stuff that's going to move into conjunction is going to be something that is in a stable orbit around Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, and somebody at some point, uh, maybe somebody is already looking into it, um, but if they are, I'm not aware of it. Um, and uh, somebody at some point may, may decide that it's worth expanding sensor networks to look at things on you know, par not par yeah, parabolic or hyperbolic um, approaches mm -hmm. uh, and see if they might cause collisions. But so long as we're looking at that 85% of stuff that's just floating around the Earth that we're not getting to, uh, bigger fish to fry. Um, so those, those would be, I think, the, the first things that people would try to, uh, to get into the pipeline. Did that answer the question? Yeah. Actually, just a follow up to that. Like, so you're saying that we get positional data from like, cooperative and uncooperative entities giving us, like, volunteering their positions. But like, some of it is debris that 
is coming from collided things. Like, are they keeping track of their own debris and being like, hey, we have this garbage that is here right now? Yes. Uh, so apologies if this was not clear. So we have yeah. cooperative missions uh, yeah. that are sending us expected flight paths. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have everything else, um, which includes non-cooperating missions and also trash. Yeah. Um, both of those, all of those things in that uncooperative trash, um, uncooperative trash, <laughs> uncooperative class, uh, Everything in that class is being fed to Kara by way of a sensor network, okay. um, yeah. which is Earth-based systems looking out at the sky, mm -hmm. uh, trying to keep track of, yes, satellites, but then also mostly just a whole bunch of trash that threatens those satellites. Okay, so ostensibly a meteorite could fall into that for sensor network. If it, if ostensibly, it was... although um, there are there are other complications which you wouldn't have any reason to know about given the um, the scope of this talk that might complicate that. Um, Generally speaking, it's easier if you have a predicted orbit for it uh, that you're monitoring over time mm, okay. uh, to keep track of that particular object. Is there an effective size minimum for that 85% threshold? There is. Um, so the, the numbers that I think the CARA handbook has in it are um, greater than one centimeter uh, is usually enough to kill a satellite. Uh, greater than five centimeters is uh, the current limit, and then there's a greater greater than ten centimeters is uh, catastrophic explosive failure. If I'm remembering those numbers correctly, um, it's in like Appendix G, I think, of the Kara Handbook. So if those numbers disagree with me, those are the right numbers, and I'm just you know hallucinating. Space is scary. It is. Uh, to what extent do you have um, primary objects reporting something just went whoosh nearby, I just saw something go past on my radar that gives you an improved solution to what you otherwise would have had? I don't know. Um, I would expect the answer to be not very often uh, because my understanding, and I'm not an expert in this area, but my understanding is that the vast majority of sensing is happening um, on the ground uh, rather than um, up in orbit. Thank you. So is the problem getting harder with the uh, advent of a lot of these? Um, the problem is getting harder all well, the time. The problem is getting harder. Okay. Well, yeah. Uh, what well, what reason specifically were you asking about? <laughs> well, well, it seems like there has been um, a bunch more of these uh, very low Earth orbit satellite constellations coming coming online. Yes, uh, so um, that is one of the major reasons uh, that the problem is getting maybe not harder but larger um, is uh, launches into space have gotten a lot cheaper um, in the last, let's call it, decade or so. Uh, and when things get cheaper, people do it more often. So there are a lot more primaries in orbit uh, to keep track of um, and to protect um, conceivably. Also, just to act as conjunctors. Um, and then on top of that, your launches tend to also create space junk. Uh, frequently, you will, you will launch your payload and you'll leave payload up there, but also you know, little rocket bits uh, floating in your wake. Uh, all of these things uh, tend to create more conjunctors, more conjunctions, more work for Kara. All I'm hearing is there's a great promo project for somebody to invent space blue ocean. Space slow motion? Space blue motion. The oh, sorry, space blue ocean. Uh, the company doing uh, ocean cleanup by preventative action by having a, just a giant net at all the uh, river openings. There are uh, a lot of, of harebrained schemes. Um, <laughs> I say harebrained because uh, nobody's ever actually gotten any of them done. Um, but like, you know those like 1950s science ideas of, oh, I know how to propel uh, my interstellar uh, ship um, out to Tau Ceti. I'll drop bombs behind it, like nuclear bombs. <laughs> you have a lot of projects that are like just so wildly out there, but also they kind of work if you do the back of the envelope. Um, this is one of those areas where you'll find these wild ideas. Another one, uh, another area where you see this sometimes is, um, and I'm obviously way off topic now, uh, another area where you can go looking for these kind of off-the-wall, super cool ideas is uh, like geoengineering things to deal with global warming. Um, people are suggesting, you know, put up a giant lens that'll diffract light away from the Earth. Uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I've completely lost my train of thought, but that's some cool stuff. To what distance like, uh, from the Earth is it worth running these models? Is there a point at which you can say effectively you're never going to hit something? I mean, obviously, yes, but what is that distance? Or uh, There is a distance. I don't recall offhand what it is. Uh, LEO is the most contested uh, orbit regime, so that's 500 kilometers to 2,000 kilometers is usually where that, that's defined. Um, so it's most important to do it there. Uh, I do believe uh, that... Uh, people are concerned about things higher up um, in, in higher Earth orbits, um, probably at least out to geo. Uh, I don't know where people say, no, nah, space is big enough out there. We're just not going to worry about it. I don't know where they draw that line. Um, I guess just kind of operationally, I'm curious if, are, are y'all just running calculations constantly and tweaking? Like, what does it look like in a day of the life of a SRE there? Like, are, is it you run the job, it's done, then you talked about running another set of calculations. What does that look like? Uh, so you know how I mentioned that I'm not wearing my NASA badge right now? Yeah, yeah. That sounds an awful lot like something wearing a NASA badge could answer. So sure. I'm, I'm going to refrain, although it's, it's a good question. OK. So what about all the fun solar flares and changes to the atmosphere? Does that hurt with the drag calculation and make yes. your life uh, worse? Yes, space weather is an important input uh, into these high fidelity models. Uh, as, as the sun enters uh, what's called solar maximum, um, as, its, as its output increases and as space weather tends to get more extreme, you see more variations in uh, the density of the atmosphere um, at these very high altitudes. And uh, that does tend to, uh, it's another complicating factor, uh, I'll say. And yeah, I think that's as much as I can safely say. Are we, are we out of questions? Come back. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, so thank you all uh, very much for attending um, and for staying a good 10 minutes after. I uh, really appreciate it. There are donuts uh, over on the side, which uh, if any of you missed them uh, as your consolation prize for losing an hour of your life. Um, yeah, great, great to be back, uh, if only briefly. Um, and I hope you found this informative. <laughs>